part of them. Mm-hmm. So um, thank you all for joining us at DataCon LA 2020 and welcome to the data engineering track. Today we'll be listening to Stargate, the gateway for some multi-models data API with uh, Cedric London. I'm your host, Stephen, and your co-host today will be Justin. So please note some house rules will be posted in the chat. You can ask questions in the Q&A and Cedric will answer them at the end of the talk. So a few words about Cedric. He is the Director of Developer Advocacy at Datastax, where he shares his passions about Cassandra and distributed architectures with developers. And he also created FF4J, an open source framework for feature toggle. So without further ado, I give you Cedric. Thank you very much. So welcome, everyone. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are on the planet. I'm uh, Cedric Lundven, developer at, uh, Director of Developer Advocacy at Datastax. I'm based in Paris uh, as of now, and we are, we are hit by such a huge tempest out there. I hope the line will hold for the, for the talk. So as an advocate, what we are doing, we are doing some training, teaching, creating some reference application for people, doing some support, and of course, like today, public speaking. FF4J is my side project. It's an open source framework uh, developed in Java. And the purpose is to enable or disable parts of your application at runtime without any restart. Today, we will discuss about Stargate. Stargate is a data gateway. So let's see first, what is a data gateway? What's the purpose? What it's used for? Then I will move to the architectures of on implementation of such a gateway. Then we'll dig into what kind of uh, backend should we pick on top of the data gateway using Apache Cassandra and see that now with Apache Cassandra, you can have a real multi-model database. Um, in all my talk, it's always full of demo. You would be able to do the demo after uh, the session. Everything is shared. I share the link of the GitHub repo already in the chat. And if you want, you can do the demo with me. There is really nothing special about it, but it's pretty powerful. And then I will just explain you what is Astra Next Generation Database as a Service, which includes Stargate already. Ready? Let's get started. Okay, so a data gateway is some kind of proxy on top of your database. So you might ask, why should you implement such a proxy on top of it? Well, as a developer, maybe you already have um, had to implement a new services. So do you like learning new query languages? SQL, N1QL, GQL, Graphlin, uh, Cypher, any NoSQL database has its own languages. And it's pretty hard to keep up. So what I think you want to do is simply, oh, this is my JSON or this is my object. Take it, save it, and give it in me back when I need it, and that's it. And this is the reason why uh, ORM object relation and mapping and spring data are so popular nowadays. So you don't care how your data is stored. You know, store my JSON, that's it. So what, what if I told you that the physical data model is part of the interface? I mean, the data API. Yes, this is not what you want. You want some loose couple between the implementation database and your API. And so do you really like to install database locally on your laptop, especially distributed database? No, that's pretty complex. Uh, so what about simply have to interact with an API and start working with it, okay? Even for your integration test. That's for developer, all right. If you already are a database administrator or already deep dive into databases, now you, if your job is to maintain this database, do you allow developer to execute direct queries against your database? Yeah. The more power you gave to developer, the, the worse, right? They tends to do whatever they like without even uh, comprehend how much they can hit the database and how many requests per second they can do. So second is, okay, now the developer needs 
a range of port to be opened, you know, huge range of tokens, you know, to allow execute queries, but also do monitoring or uh, get some health check of the database. And so what? now you need to open the port and it's not as secure as you would like to be. You simply want the API. Single port, please, everybody use this port and you're safe, right? Last, um, you are in charge of a database and now people need to use that data. Do you need to create each time a new team to build an API on top of your database just for this new project? No, what if some kind of tools put on top of your database can enable the API like that and you don't have to implement it uh, anymore? So developer needs that uh, gateway, database administrator also need that gateway. And you know what? If you don't put any gateway between those two, this is what happens most of the time. Developers and DB admin feel like they like each other, but in real life, they don't. <laughs> they just hate each other. DevOps, yeah, not yet. Okay, so the rationale behind the data gateway is putting a proxy on top of the database, enabling APIs. We will see later create APIs, REST API, JSON API, gRPC, a lot of API. But simply put, this is a proxy on top of the database enabling API. All right. So how do you do that? Okay, let's dig into that. So Stargate is an implementation uh, on these new topics. Okay, this is rather new. Um, it's not often that you can explain to people kind of a padding shift. I truly believe this is one of those. We used to run API gateways, proxy on top of API, and in the API gateway, you add throttling, monitoring, security, and a lot of technical features that you don't have to implement in the API. Well, now with a data gateway, enabling the API, you don't have to do it on your own. And of course, in this data gateway, you could potentially also include the API gateway features. Why not? As of now, Stargate is really at the persistence level uh, enabling API. Okay. So this Stargate is a proxy. I told you it's a dedicated runtime. We can work with multiple storage and expose multiple kind of API. The idea is really to introduce some loose couple between people using the data and how the data is stored. All right, so if I dig into Stargate, on the, on the top, there are some API extension points, ways for a developer to implement uh, APIs for everyone. Don't worry, you don't have to implement those. We, uh, we have done uh, a few implementation already for you. And the persistent extension is how people will store the data. So now you can switch, potentially you can switch from one persistence, like one kind of databases, Cassandra, NoSQL, um, Mongo, for instance, to another one. Uh, and the loose coupling is introduced by the gateway. And the gateway will handle authentication, uh, API and um, exposure, security uh, as of now. But later we will add new technical features um, to add more capabilities to this gateway. And you know what? This tool, this framework is open source. It's not something I sell. Stargate.io you see what it is, you can run it, and you know what, we will run it together today. So as of now, okay, for the persistent storage, we do have Cassandra 3.11, Cassandra 4.0, um, uh, Datastax Enterprise, okay, this one is an enterprise product, 6.8. And as an a APIs, we do have the CRUD, create, read, update, delete, search as REST, we do have the GraphQL, we do have a document API. Remember, take my JSON, save my JSON, I don't care. And we also have the existing Cassandra query language enabled on Stargate. And you would authenticate 
to HTTP basic. Okay? So you might say, okay, um, so Cassandra, 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 um, why, what is uh, the database Cassandra? Why did you pick this first uh, persistence extension? Um, and how can you pretend that this single uh, class of NoSQL database can do multi-model? All right, let's, let's. All right, Apache Cassandra has a multi-model database. So Cassandra created in 208 is a NoSQL distributed database. Every word is important. It's NoSQL, so it's not SQL. There is no relation, no joins, no acid transaction, because it's distributed. We'll see later that in a distributed system, you cannot ensure any more consistency, availability, and uh, partition tolerance. So real acid transaction, distributed transaction are pretty costly. It's a distributed database. So you will install Cassandra on a server, what we call a node. On this node, you can do about 3,000 transactions per second and per core, treatment per second and per core. And you do have a capacity of about one terabyte per node, but it's distributed, right? So you expect Cassandra to be installed on multiple nodes. In this installation, there is no master. Okay, it's not a master slave architectures at all. This is what we call masterless. Each node communicates to each other using what we call gossiping. And nodes are grouped logically with something called a data center or a ring. One characteristic about um, Cassandra is that it scales linearly. You need more capacity, add new nodes. You need more throughput, add new nodes. Simple as like that. This is one of the only databases that can scale linearly. And this is why if you look at famous customer from, not customer, famous user of Cassandra, you will find some Uber, Netflix, Apple, because those companies are global and needs a, you know, huge servers and they pick Cassandra for the scalability and also the way you can install it. I will show you that in a minute. So in Cassandra, you find some tables. Okay, remember the multi-model uh, I gave you? You store tables in Cassandra, but in Cassandra, you will define one colon that you will name partition key. And this partition key will code how the data is distributed among the nodes. Remember, it's distributed. So if you do select star from a table, is that a good use case for Cassandra? Because now you will have to, to scan all the nodes to get all the value and it can be slow. What you want to do is always provide a where clause where you will provide here the country code. Then application will go to the proper node and get everything in a single read. And so when you uh, create some application on top of row Cassandra, you need to be very careful about the data model you are using. You need to define table based on your queries because the where clause of your queries will design how the data is distributed. You might also notice that the partition key, it's not enough to ensure unicity of a record. So in Cassandra, there is a primary key composed with partition key and something else. I won't go to too much detail, something else. It's called clustering colon, but never mind. So very important to understand how data is stored in Cassandra and how we want to abstract this storage. Okay, so now the data is distributed around the nodes. Each node is in charge of what we call a range, a list of value of the partition key. The partition key is hashed using a hashing function and you get um, numbers which we call tokens. So each node is in charge of a range of tokens. So how does it work? 
Now, as a client app, I come with a new value. I will hash the partition key, get the token, and I can contact any of the nodes. Remember, no master, no nothing relevant to master slave. I will pick any of the nodes. This node will be labeled as a coordinator node for the request. Okay, two requests won't pick the same coordinator node. Okay, the coordinator node take the data 59. Oh, I'm not in charge of 59, so I will push the data to the proper replica node. Okay, all right. Now the data is replicated. So every single piece of data is replicated multiple times. This is what we call the replication factor. What it means, if, if now I came with 59 and contact another node, this node will push the values to those two nodes. Okay. And best practice is to use replication factor three. So now you can contact any of the nodes, ask to write your data or read your data, it's working in the same way, and the data is pushed or read in the proper replica, like that. So why do we do that? Okay. It's, um, so, data, Cassandra scale linearly, why would you put your data replicated in this manner? It's not to distribute the load, to be honest. It's really that now that as there is no master and the data is available multiple times, now you can lose any of the node. And it's not a big deal. Now, if I want to read the data 59 and if one node is not available, I still have two remaining nodes to get back to the data. And you know what? The node that noticed that, oh, I was not able to get the data from every node. So one node may be down. Okay. Well, I will store locally this data. And when the node will be online again, I will simply put it back, the data. And the database is self healing Okay. On a Cassandra cluster, you can have one ring or multiple ring. So this is a pretty nice way to, you know, install one ring in each cloud, part of the same cluster. And now you do have a single data layer available in multi-cloud. Cost of communication in between clouds are still pretty expensive, but technically speaking, you can do that, okay? Um, and uh, you can enable VPC peering uh, between cloud and Effectively, now your app um, can have the same data available in all the clouds. So, I told you, um, in a distributed system, you cannot ensure a validity, consistency, and partition tolerance. This is what we call the CAP theorem or the MacBrew theorem. With everything I just told you, you can say that Cassandra by default is AP. Availability, partition tolerance. Availability because data is replicated and if you lose a node, it's not a big deal. And partition tolerance because there is no master. If you lose the network between two nodes, um, the gossiping will still work with the other nodes and it's not a big deal. When the, node, the network comes back, everything's fine. This is also one of the reasons why it fits pretty well with the cloud. But by settings in the request, we can move from this AP um, default behavior to more consistency. You will define on each request what we call consistency level, okay? And if you uh, use the rule, I won't go maybe too much in detail, but if you use the rule, the consistency level read plus the consistency level write is bigger than the replication factor. When you read and when you write, you provide the consistency level. How many nodes should reply to my query before I can acknowledge the client that it's okay? I read with, uh, let's say, quorum. Quorum is a majority of the node. So, replication factor three, okay? If I execute a read or a write with quorum, I expect the majority of the node to reply two over three, okay? So, the first here, my client will write into node here, 
number one, node here, number two. I put a AV check to say, okay, those two nodes has been updated, but not yet the last uh, one on the bottom. If at the very same time, another client want to read exactly the same value, well, you might say, oh, which value will it pick? Because uh, the two check it nodes have the latest value, but the guy at the bottom, not yet. And if some reason you also read with quorum and bad luck, instead of picking the two updated nodes, you pick one updated and what that does not be updated, the client will get two values, right? The latest and the oldest. In Cassandra, the latest writes always win and you are unsure to get always the same, uh, the latest value. All right, so with everything, why did you, why did we pick uh, Cassandra as first storage implementation for Stargate? Well, scalability, if high throughput, high volume, you need more uh, capability, add new nodes, you need more throughput, add new nodes, okay? Second is availability, data is replicated, and so if you lose any node, it's not a big deal. As it's distributed, you can have uh, data all across the world and it's cloud native. Remember the distribution among multi-cloud? Well, you can do multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, and that's pretty relevant for a gateway um, on top of the data. Okay. The way Cassandra stores the data is called colon oriented. You get a key, and multiple columns creating a tables. This partition key uh, will code how the data is distributed. Okay, so Cassandra, default behavior, that's the, the specification of Cassandra. It's column oriented, NoSQL database. But there are others NoSQL database uh, out there. So first class of NoSQL are key value. Well, strictly speaking, key value has really a subset of uh, column oriented. You can have uh, in a partition a single value, which is a key, and a single column, which is the value. And now you do have a key value, key value, and you can uh, ensure the consistency you want with the consistency level. Time series database? Well, data model in uh, Cassandra fit the time series use case. I mean, first, high throughput and data model you can have as a key, the sensor ID, as values, um, the, the, the timestamps and the different values you want to get for your sensors working pretty well. Uh, you can have a dedicated ring for uh, saving all the data and another ring in the same cluster to do some Spark aggregation, Spark machine learning processing. So Cassandra and Spark were very well uh, one, uh, one, other, one and each other, uh, especially for the OLAP queries. What about graph database, which is kind of, uh, uh, not the last, but also a pretty famous kind of NoSQL database. Well, it's not in the OSS Cassandra as of now, but just for you to know, in the DataStax Enterprise product, we have fork Titan DB, and now you can simply say, okay, this table in Cassandra expose this table as a edge or as um, as a edge or as a, a node vertex for my graph, and you can execute graph traversal using the Gremlin language. You can test uh, DataStax Enterprise for free. There are some Docker images for you to test, uh, but it's not part of OSS Cassandra and it's still not there in Stargate. So what's missing here? Remember, you want your JSON. You want to save the JSON. And saving the JSON in Cassandra, well, you could do that already. There are some commands, insert JSON, select JSON part of the query language for Cassandra. You can also have set list map, user defined type, and even nested structures within a uh, UDT. But the issue is it's strongly coupled. There is a schema. So you can only insert um, something that has been defined. It's not what you want schemaless. And so the last frontier was, okay, now I simply want to do 
to insert and retrieve any JSON document efficiently, allow schemaless. I want to read and write uh, fast, even if um, it's look like tables. And when I do delete, I would like to uh, limit a uh, uh, known person ratio, which is tombstone, limiting the number of uh, items um, created when you delete something. You know, something very efficient, JSON startup. Okay, let's go. So to do that, we implement at the Stargate level something called document shredding. Every single layer in the JSON will have its own colon, okay? So I do have my key, which will be my document ID, and then for each nested uh, property, I will, use, I will have some PO to P9 properties. And in the end, I will have values, so it could be a Boolean value, text value, or double value, and the leaf. So let's see what it looks like. If uh, I give you... Excuse me, Cedric. Um, I'm just, this is just a time warning. There's about, uh, you've got like four minutes or so left before uh, Q&A. All right. Okay, so um, if you look at the document trading, um, this is A, B, C, and you can see that A, B, one for the leaf one, and AC2 for the leaf two, and now there is no B. Okay, I can do some uh, arrays, <clears throat> but you know what? Let's move into more demo mode. So I give you the link about my demo, okay? It's all in conference 2020, Stargate. Okay, first it will ask you to install Docker, Docker Compose, and curl. And what you want to do first is start all the containers. So I already do that and see if I go docker ps, okay, I see that I do have my containers running. So first way to uh, interact with uh, the Stargate is the SQL, uh, it's the SQL. So I will move on. I will see, okay, which one of these container is Stargate? Okay, this is the API. This is the IP, sorry. And I will use an existing SQLSH and use this guy. Okay. Now I'm connected using SQLSH against Stargate. Okay. And it's, you have all the power of SQLSH. You know, this is what, how you would create a key space. This is how you would uh, create some tables inside the key space very as we used to do Cassandra query language. And you can insert values either using default SQL or JSON. All right, nothing special. So just telling you that this Stargate has a SQL engine, okay. So I just use the SQL port. Now on the, on the Stargate, there is a Swagger providing some schema operation, data operation, which is the CRUD, and document operations. And there is also a playground to do some graph QL. So let me show you quickly. The first things we need to have is a token. So I will invoke the authentication just to have a token. And with that, I can go to, let's see, schema and just list what's so I need to provide my token. And now I, I do have a list of uh, key spaces. Okay, easy, easy. I can create a new key space. So I will go there, I will go to post. And now I want to create a key space. So let's see, um, create, oh no, not add tables, but create key space. Okay, this guy, create key space. I will create a key space providing key space two, replication three. And again, I need to provide my key. Okay. And I'm able to execute. And so here you see how to add a table, how to create rows, how to insert values or read values using the REST API. Okay. In the same Swagger UI, you can see that you do have as well document API. 
And so now you can simply have a document and insert a document. So this one is important, let's see. I already have an authentication token. I will create a namespace, okay, so which is kind of a key space for the document. So I will go to document, create a namespace, try out, say, I want to create a key space, no, namespace like that. I provide these and I will execute. Okay, so now I do have my namespace. I can list the namespace, but what I really want to do is create uh, a document. So I will go to turbo mode and instead of just showing you the UI, I will do the items with some curl command. And so what I do here, I will simply invoke the namespace one collection video and I will create exactly the same item that we did before, but now I provide a full JSON and I don't care about how the, the collection is, uh, either any schema to handle this video, not anymore. I can read and write this guy, um, so I can retrieve all the document from this. Okay, uh, yep, I, I missed the curl. <laughs> See, I can retrieve the document. I can find the document by, at, by its ID. I can find a document using a where clause. And now you do not need to provide the partition key each time. You can provide any values inside the document and you can now do where on any column. Pretty neat. And last but not least, there is also GraphQL. Okay, so if I go back and create one small token, okay, I can use the GraphQL API provided, providing, okay, let me put that in bigger. I put some authentication token like that, and I will, let's see, create a key space. Let's call the key space a library. So I'm using GraphQL Playground, so I can create a key space. I can also now create tables, which here are uh, books and author. So I go back here and I can create some, some oh, key space three. Now it's a library. This is the name of the key space we just created together. And now I do have two tables. I can go there, see my library, which is the key space we just add. I provide the header again, okay? And I will be done with my demo. And could take a few questions. Okay, and I will insert using some mutation over here. See, I'm really following uh, the readme you can go and do it on your own. And as you can see, I can not only do some document API and create new documents, but I can also totally, on top of Cassandra, use some GraphQL, okay? And if I only have the author, you can do that like that, okay? And at DataSax, we provide Cassandra as a service in the cloud, okay? And in this Astra, Stargate is enabled. So if I go there and you can simply create a new database, it's also part of the readme. You can create a database for free. So here I did a demo, everything using Docker, but if you don't want to do anything, you can simply go to Astra and create a new database. Add database and boom, you can install. You can even have a database for free. It's a free tier, free forever, no credit card to provide. And with that, I just want to conclude saying that, okay, in Astra, there is the full Stargate uh, for you, enabling document API, 
GraphQL API, REST API, SQL API, on top of Cassandra. But Stargate itself is open source, and it's go to stargate.io, and you can see that it's in EV development. Soon, the Kafka interface will be there. But as of now, you can go to Astra, create a free account, and redo the demo with uh, the database. OK, everything is available, including Stargate. I'm a developer advocate at DataStax, and at DataStax, <coughs> we give you a ton of resources for you to learn Cassandra. Academy.datastax.com, datastax.com slash dev. Everything is free, by the way. Community.datastax.com, which is Stack Overflow for Cassandra, and uh, my very own, I own the YouTube channel, DataStax Developer, where we do live workshop every Wednesday, Thursday for free, you can subscribe to the channel and you can see multiple topics that we are covering. Machine learning, Kubernetes, Cassandra, Python, Java, Node, tons of workshop there already pre-recorded. It's all live. So take a look and provide some feedback. And with that, I'm done and all ready right. for questions. Thank you. Uh... Thank you very much, Cedric, for your uh, interesting talk. Um, we are, in fact, uh, almost out of time. Um, so, but there, I, I do have one question which I will post um, in the chat. You mentioned graph databases. So, are there plans to sort of implement them with Cassandra? Because you said it. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, as of now, in the stargate.io, you can see that the persistence is multiple version of Cassandra and Data Stacks Enterprise. But it needs to be a community effort, okay? So anyone can fork and implement the Mongo uh, backend, for instance, or um, Redis backend. There is nothing preventing it. There is simply a bunch of interface to implement. And that's the real purpose of Target. It's not to be only based on Cassandra. It enables uh, a huge range of use cases for Cassandra, and it is the reason why it has been built at the first place. But the purpose of Target is really to be able to be plugged on multiple uh, technology. I see. Well, uh, thank you very much. So uh, thank you, Cedric, for your presentation. I appreciate all the attendees for their questions and interactions during the session. So please contact the speakers if you have further questions on the topic. And please provide your comments and feedback to us on the community board or start a discussion there to connect with others in the DataCon LA 2020 community. Thank you very much for joining today's presentation. And I hope you can gain some insights from this session and have a wonderful day. And thank you for being part of this year's DataCon LA. Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.